be here. I'm excited to be able to talk to you today about assessment, um, as well as share with you a little bit kind of like of where I am. I'm actually transitioning um, from working my latest job at the Cook County Department of Public Health, of which I resigned a couple weeks ago. And so I'm in kind of this stay-at-home mom, doing a little bit of work here and there, and then getting ready to start working for my church in a couple of weeks. So it's a very interesting time um, in my life um, where I'm just really trying to figure it out. And what I've learned, and I think this is what the lesson that God is teaching me through this process is, I don't know the next step. And so this is truly a faith walk because I am so used to trying to prepare the very next step. Okay, well I need to do this and I need to do that and then that. Now it's like, I don't know. So it's just like, it's me, my husband, baby, we're going to make it happen. So um, that's kind of where I'm coming from. So again, it's, I'm happy to be here. Um, looking forward to this um, presentation. And so where is Little This is Little Pleasure. Yes. I am not technologically advanced, so hopefully this is going the right way. Yes, yes it is. It is. Um, Dr. Plemmy has already gone over the objectives. I highlighted the two um, that my understanding is what I'll speak from today. Um, and please, I don't want this to be a lecture. If there's questions that come up or if something isn't clear or if you have a comment, please jump in at any time. Um, I really um, thrive on interacting. I don't want to just talk and bore you to death. So please feel free to um, interject. Um, so, we talk about assessment, and I have my cheat sheet here. So, when we think of assessment, what I did is I, I took a couple of um, definitions that um, have just been circulated within um, kind of like public health scholarly journals, as well as books, and kind of like some definitions of what's typically considered um, assessments, especially from community health perspectives. Everybody has the handout? Just, okay. Um, and so you'll see a, a couple of them. Um, I'm going to talk more from the public health lens, um, as was my assignment, but I might dibble dub on the face part a little bit. Um, but when we think about the community health assessment, um, we really think about a systematic process of really getting a better idea as to what's going on within a community, congregation, some type of entity. It could be a block, it could be a, a school, it could be however you're defining community or however you're defining your audience. Um, to really identify the key issues, whether the problems, assets, really what's going on in that particular um, um, entity. The ultimate goal is to um, really get a diagnosis and then from there develop strategies to address those local health needs. Um, another definition, community health assessment is the work, so the actual blood, sweat, and tears that's done in order to collect, analyze, um, use data to educate and mobilize communities, develop priorities, um, garner resources and plan actions to improve public health. Um, so that's kind of like the um, scholarly kind of definition. I have another definition that's up there. This is where I'm dib dibble dabbling a little bit in the safe part. And I want to use a quote um, that my pastor uses a lot. When we think about the assets that we have and the gifts that we have within our particular um, congregation, we really believe that everything is in the house. And so I believe that too. Even in the most distressed community, however you decide, define distress, there are strengths there, there's assets there, and they can all come together in order to um, come together and really make change in a particular community. Okay, so why assess? Um, and so these main um, kind of steps, why when you think about an assessment, you really want to gain an understanding. You really want to know what's going on in that particular entity, in that particular group, in that particular community, in that particular congregation, um, what it is. And in that gaining of understanding, you want to be able to learn what are the facts and what is fiction. So what are the true facts that's going on? What are some beliefs that may be held? Um, what are some perceptions and what is reality? We know that for some folks, perceptions can be reality. Um, so you really want to get a, a good understanding. Um, and then I have highlighted the needs and the assets. What are the needs? What's lacking? What isn't there? What can be built upon? What are the assets? What are the gifts that are there? What, are, what kind of um, resources already exist? What, what's, what's available? Um, so that's really a, one of the reasons for assessing is to gain an understanding as to really what's going on. Um, next, to compile information to help make decisions regarding resources. So you want to get all of this understanding, you want to get this information in order to make a decision on what's needed or what the next step should be. You can't move on to um, really developing some, developing some type of action plan or getting a better idea as to what exists if you don't compile that information. We're going to talk a little bit about ways to compile that information. 
Um, next, um, another reason to assess is you want to determine action. So it's a lot of us, how many of us have done some type of community assessment, a health assessment, or congregational assessment? Okay, so a, a, a quite a few people. Um, how many of you, and you might not want to raise your hand, I will raise my hand if this question no. Um, how many of you have helped put assessments and then it really didn't do as much as you thought you were going to be able to do to address it? <laughs> okay. Um, so that, that's, that's that situation where you do the assessment and then it kind of sits on the shelf a little bit and gets dust and then you bring it out and like, oh yeah, that was something we should do. Yeah. Um, so we want to be able to determine action. <coughs> Next, we want to evaluate change, results, outcomes. And so after we've gained an understanding, what, after we've compiled information to help make decisions regarding resources, once we've determined action and then done something about whatever we found, we're going to be able to evaluate change, results, and outcomes. You know, did we accomplish what we set to do based on what we found in the assessment? What's different? What's the same? Um, what additional information may be needed? And so for those of you um, who didn't raise your hand, who were actually able to take an assessment and do something about it and address it, how did, how did that make you feel after you were able to do that? Triumphant. Oh, I'm sorry. Triumphant. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Any other? Useful. Yeah. Useful. Mm -hmm. Any other? You see, I'm not picking on the ones who weren't who said it on the shelf because I know what that feeling is like too. So we won't move on to that. Okay. And so next. So when we look at steps to assessment, um, this is taken, I have it on the, um, the resources pages um, next. Um, this is not the world according to Geneva. This is the information <laughs> that I've been able to um, you know, pull it together in steps that I've taken in some of the work that I've done with um, my colleagues. And so these steps that I'm gonna outline, these are ideal situations. Um, I don't think, in my personal opinion, there's, there's ways to do assessment and the more community-based and the more that you involve those assessees, and the people that are part of the community or the congregation or the group that you're working with or the entity, the more real your information is going to be. We'll talk a little bit um, more about that later. But I just wanted to say the disclaimer, I'm not saying that every single step has to be done a certain way, but I think if I had to say what one thing has to be included within assessment, and that's including the folks um, that are being assessed or the community that's being assessed or the situation that's being assessed so that you can have real life, real time, um, attachment and those folks are going to be helpful for when you determine your action. We'll get into that too. So, um, a first step is obtain leadership support and establish a quote unquote assessment team. Now, you want whatever leadership, whether it's within your congregation, is, is this the pastor or some um, group that reports to the pastor or works closely with the pastor, or within a community, it could be um, black club leaders, it could be um, folks that work with organizations, community residents. But establish, get that support to doing this assessment with the idea and with the belief that, again, a action, action is going to be determined based on what these assessment findings um, tell you. And establish an assessment team. So you're not the lone ranger going out doing the assessment by yourself. But you've got a team of poor folks and a buy-in from the leadership in order to do the assessment. Next, define the area of the group. Specify the target population. You know, what's being assessed? A lot of times you'll say, oh, well, we need to do an assessment. And it's not really clear exactly what the group is that's being assessed. Like, for example, if you say, oh, I want to assess my community, we could get into a whole conversation about what community means. Um, so you have to have those definitions um, kind of agreed upon with your assessment team and your leadership group in order to proceed. Um, determine the level of community involvement. I, I um, kind of um, touched on this a little bit. What will be the assessee's involvement? I mean, it, there should be. Um, some involvement from those that live within the area or those within the congregation or what have you to actually um, assist with this process. In an ideal situation, they would be driving the process and then you would be supporting them and bringing whatever types of skills and um, expertise you have. Again, that's a whole other <laughs> leadership session, I believe, but you have to be able to um, have that, that involvement. Um, define the purpose and the scope. You want to be able to define what it is that you're trying to assess. Um, and sometimes, there can be assessments done where it's like, you, you're not sure of what's going on, so you want to just gather a whole bunch of information. Other assessments could be, we want, I think um, you all have been looking at, looking at um, infant mortality. And so there could be certain things within infant mortality that affect infant mortality that you want to zero in on. So it really depends on 
um, the scope and the breadth and the depth and width of what you're um, trying to get a better idea of. Now, I have this in red, the collect and analyze data, just because from the public health lens, um, us public health folks, what does the data say? And for a lot of us, I throw myself in, yes. in that sphere. Because um, now I'm channeling yes. like my epidemiology colleagues that um, um, try to push this in, uh, in our heads as far as um, development of programs and evaluation and that type of thing. But collect and analyze the data. The who, what, when, where, how. Um, looking at statistics from data sources. So looking at infant mortality rates within um, areas. I don't mean to pick on you all, but I remembered you all <laughs> right away. So. Um, and then looking at both qualitative and quantitative data. Um, Dr. Flemming talked about that. And so we have data sources that says, I'm making these up, 30% of um, um, students who start um, kindergarten will graduate you know, 12 years later from high school. I think it's actually lower than that. But, um, so, so that's a, a data statistic, but then you want to look at the qualitative um, data behind that. Why is that? What's going on within families? What's going on within um, certain areas? Are there some schools that have higher rates? Are there schools that have lower rates? What's going on in those schools that have lower rates? You know, that type of thing. So you want to be able to, um, you know, put the meat around that and get a better understanding about what the data seems to be telling you. Um, so that's why that's in red, just because that's the public health, I think, part that we really um, zero, zero in on when we're talking about um, um, data. Okay, and so after you've collected all that information, gotten your leadership buy-in, have done all those other steps, so you've done the assessment, however that assessment has um, taken place, and we're gonna talk about specific tools you can use. So you're reviewing the assessment data, um, and then in reviewing that data, it's important that you have folks that actually can help you understand what that data is. So that's when it's good to have folks from different backgrounds to be able to help um, understand and help um, edu not educate, but help communicate um, the results of the assessment. So that's that next one. Um, so you want to be able to document and communicate results. You want to be able to publicize what you found and ideally have some kind of written report. Um, and I think the communication um, is key because a lot of times um, Assessments are done, and then you have these binders of data, information, you've talked to community members, you've had focus groups, you've done town hall meetings, and people are looking at you like, so what does that mean? And so you can rattle off a bunch of data points and say, well, we did this, we took this step, we did that, but if it's not communicated in a way that people can understand and something that's real to them, then it's useless and it's worthwhile, and you've wasted, um, um, in my opinion, time and resources. So that next step, consider promoting community dialogue, I think it's very much related to the communication piece because you want to be able to have the assessment data and, and communicate that, but then hear what people, try to understand what people are, what you think people are hearing you say. And the next plan for action. Um, again, you've um, done all of this work, you have these assessment findings, you have these ideas, you want to be able to put the plan together, okay, how are we going to address this given we know X, Y, and Z. Um, and then you always want to be able to monitor your progress. And that's getting more into the action phase as far as what you do once you have that assessment. What, how are you going to monitor um, your plan that you put together? How are you going to monitor um, the steps that you're taking in order to address um, whatever issue um, that, you're, that you're looking at? Um, assessment tools. And so these are seven um, tools that you can use. Most of them are more of... Um, um, qualitative um, in, in nature, um, but the health statistics one on the lower left hand corner, that's more um, of data that you can get from like public health departments or um, your um, municipal area or um, other agencies that collect this type of data, depending on what kind of data you're looking at, housing data, infant mortality data, obesity um, rates in the particular community. Um, I'm trying to give up some other examples, throw out some examples of some data that you can request and get from a health department, for example. Youth violence. Youth violence, thank you, Lisa. Census data. <laughs> Census data. Mm -hmm. Vital statistics. Vital statistics. Mm -hmm. Risk behavior data. Yep, risk behavior data. Okay. Yeah, those are all things. Housing stock, um, that type of thing you're looking at, like lead poisoning or something um, mm -hmm. like that. So there, there's a lot of information that is out there, and there's a lot of information where people have already done that type of work, and you can be able to just use that and not um, 
you know, try to develop or try to put tools together to figure out what's going on um, within a particular area. Um, and so let's look, let's look at some of these um, assessment tools and we'll, we're going to go into more detail about them. So how many of you have heard of photo voice? And don't let me pick on you, Marsha, because I will. But <laughs> go ahead. Please explain your um, definition of that. It's asking members of the community to take pictures around whatever the neighborhood or school um, so you can see through their eyes and through the, the photos. Yep. Did everybody get hurt yeah. in the back about photo voice? Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's great. And I, I have to put in a plug. Carolyn Wong, um, who's one of the developers of photo voice, is one of my professors at the University of Michigan, so I just have to say that. Um, but yeah, she, um, so with photo voice, and that's something that we have used um, throughout some of the work that we've done, and when I was at the county department too, um, around um, issues around youth and youth violence and what's going on um, in communities, so thank you. Um, so focus groups on the bottom right hand corner. Who's either done a focus group, participated in a focus group, or just know about a focus group? Okay, almost everybody. Okay. And so when you think of a focus group, like what comes to mind for you for focus groups? Making sure every right here. Yeah. Making sure everybody <laughs> sorry, that's at ahead. the table gets heard. I'm sorry, Lisa. Making sure everyone that's at the table gets heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of the Common theme. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. When I think about a focus group, I think about the community involvement. You, know, the, uh, you may have leaders like at Catholic Churches, we've had focus group, but we make sure we pull in the community yeah. for the subject. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Others from focus groups? Just, um, just tagging along with that and affirming to make sure that every group is represented. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. All right. Um, windshield tours. Has people are people familiar with that term? I see some yeses and noes. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about. It. Okay. So for a windshield tour, um, can be included as part of photo voice. So photo voice is usually windshield tour and photo voice usually go hand in hand a, a lot of times. So a windshield tour is exactly what it is. You are in a car and you're driving around looking out the windshield and really looking at the community um, or the area. So for example, if you are, um, I use your example, Lisa, like youth violence prevention. So you may um, have some folks that want to get in the car and go into a particular area um, that might have um, higher risk of youth um, violent acts that occur in a particular area. And so you're driving around in the community and you're really looking at the community from that lens. And so you might notice, um, you know, a community center that no longer is uh, a community center is boarded up. So you might take a picture of that. That's where you may use photo voice. Um, you may drive around and you'll see um, maybe like broken glass or you might see a bunch of um, um, corner stores, or liquor stores in the neighborhood. You might see parks where um, there's a basketball, um, what is that called? Um, who without the, yeah. the thing? That's <laughs> about stand without the hoop. Um, or it might be a playground that has like paraphernalia and like yucky stuff when you went wonder kid. So you, you want to look at the community, but and I focused on the negatives purposely. But then also in that windshield tour, you could be going in the community and you'll see like a beautiful garden, or you'll see um, a house that's taken care of really nice and you know Grandma Turner lives there and all the kids go over there and have story time or, or something like that. Or there may be um, a particular, um, you know, um, man in the neighborhood who's taken a group of boys kind of under his wings um, and really worked with them and, and done after school programs or you may see a particular school. And so you really um, literally get in the car, take um, take notes about what you're saying, um, and you're clear about what area or what community that you're focusing on. So that that's a windshield tour, which I find to be very um, um, telling because a lot of information, especially if you're not familiar um, with a particular community, a lot of times you're looking at it with a whole different um, set of eyes, and you'll notice something that someone who may have worked in a particular community may not have noticed, either from a, um, a need or asset um, base. Have I gone through everything? Okay, key informant interviews, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm watching time. So key informant interviews, has anyone done um, like a key informant interview, or, or know what those are? Yes, sir. Oh. Yes, I'll just say yes. Oh, okay, okay. So when you think about a key informant interviews, um, you, you're going into a community and you wanna be able to talk to folks um, who know a lot about that community, who live in that community, 
Um, and so a key informant could be a director of, of, of a center, it could be the grandma that lives in a, in a neighborhood, it could be um, some youth um, that have been roped. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yep, gatekeepers is what she's saying. And so those folks are who are kind of like the movers and the shakers um, in communities. Um, surveys, we're pretty familiar with surveys. Um, I saved asset mapping for last because we're going to actually go through a process um, around an asset map. But does anybody have any questions about what I talked to you so far? Ronnie, how am I doing one more time? Because I didn't know okay. And so assets. And so this is going to um, piggyback a little bit uh, um, based on what you all have um, gone through in your last session. But this is just a picture of um, some community residents who are coming together to really assess a particular community. And so this example, when they um, really wanted to look at the assets that um, are in an actual community, is divided up by three different areas. And it could be more areas. Um, it doesn't have to be just these three. And we can talk about that more. So in a community assets map, you'll see there's um, part of the square where there's local institutions, institutions and resources, so schools and businesses. Um, you know, hospitals, facility, um, government agency, kind of like verbal casting down of stories uh, within a community, um, local councils, block clubs, that type of thing. Um, we have community associations, service clubs, churches, um, sporting teams, you know, a neighborhood um, center. And then you look at the, the community access as far as individuals and gifts of individuals. And so you're looking at the, the young people that are in the community. A lot of times people look at youth in a negative way, but they're, you also can look at them in a positive way. It's the future. It's 100% of our future. And so um, they're definitely assets in the community. All residents, senior citizens, the history that they have, the, the wisdom that they can share with our um, younger generation. Um, and then people that are labeled in any type of way, marginalized folks, people who are um, kind of cast off sometimes in our society, but those, those are all gifts and individuals that are um, um, in the area. Um, but what I want to do is just give you an example of information from um, an asset mapping um, process that was used in the University of Missouri, and they're focusing on reducing teen teenage pregnancy. I forget um, what community area um, within the state of Missouri. Um, but um, the steps that they used, um, very similar to the, next, the previous slide, where they wanted to be able to identify that assessment team, wanted to be able to identify the individual gifts, talents, and skills um, that can help with developing some type of reducing teenage pregnancy program. Um, they wanted to inventory the, system, the citizen associations um, that are relevant to teenage pregnancy, um, and they wanted to identify the institutions that already existed in the, um, um, in the area. And so looking at the handout, so, um, for this example, the geographic area that they used was the entire um, county, and I apologize, I don't have the county on there, but I can, I can tell you. Um, but it was made up of six towns in a particular county. Um, and then the assets of, uh, or the resources that they needed, and we'll talk a little bit more about the ones that actually existed too. They named um, the support of faith communities, healthcare professionals, schools, mass media, social services, youth professionals and volunteers, youth groups, um, money, training for individual and group counseling um, for teens, places to meet in groups and one-on-one, -on -one, educational materials, um, mentors for teens. Um, and so then also some in the key individuals that they named um, was a Reverend Smith, who was a chair of the Ministerial Alliance in the county, um, a woman who was a volunteer who worked with limited resources um, and folks in communities that um, were really struggling economically. And then there was a gentleman who was a youth counselor in the school system and had a high respect of youth and parents who both saw him as being a positive influence. And then there was a woman who just knew everybody in the county, and I don't mean just, but she was very popular um, in the county and she networked with many organizations and she was kind of a connector and able to connect folks um, and very resourceful. Um, and so some of the citizen associations in that particular community some examples, there were PTAs, parent teacher associations in all six of the school districts. There were also um, a volunteer fire department. There were county human services and a coalition. Um, there was a ministerial alliance. There was a United Way that was there. Um, and there were various faith communities and congregations that were present. Um, some institutions in the community, I believe it was the fourth or fifth um, um, column. Um, it was the social, the Missouri Department of Social Services. There was the actual University Outreach and Extension that was um, doing helping with the assessment. 
Um, there was the there was a coalition of different elementary and secondary schools. The Girl Scouts were very prevalent um, in that county. Um, they had a mental health department. The Department of Public Health was at the table. Um, hospitals, clinics, um, and various community groups. Um, so those were things that they kind of mapped out um, and just um, did an inventory, um, if you will, of things that existed within that within that area. And so this next. Um, um, slide just has some of the resources. Again, I said that wasn't the Geneva School of Thought, but this is a list where you can learn more about like asset mapping and, and, and health assessments. I recommend all of these, um, especially I mean, some of the things that I learned um, when I was first learning about community health assessments and doing organizing work. Um, there was a lot of, uh, at that time, John McKnight um, and looking at um, the community from an asset base instead of such a need base. Because right at that time, a lot of focus had been, had, had been really geared towards what's needed in the community. And until, I think, around um, that time, there was more focus on what are the assets and what, what are the positive ways to look at um, a, particular, a particular area, a particular community. 